Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for Black Turn Conservation at St. Clair Flats. We're so excited to have you join us to learn more about these fascinating birds and the work involved in monitoring their conservation. My name is Sarah Halson, and I am the program coordinator for Detroit Audubon, an organization dedicated to fostering the appreciation and conservation of birds and the environment that we share. We could not do the work we do without our funders. Members. I wanted to thank those of you who are members and supporting projects like these. Some quick housekeep housekeeping before I introduce our speaker for today. Um, you are able to control your video and microphone in the bottom left of your screen. That you keep yourself muted so we don't have feedback from your microphones um, in the chat box by clicking on the chat button on the bottom of your screen. We will be stopping to answer questions throughout the presentation. So please add any questions you might into the chat. Also introduce yourself so we know who's here and where you're from. Um, Noah, our office administrator, will be keeping up with our presentation through closed captioning. So if you need, please click on the subtitles on the bottom and they will open so you can watch those as the presentation um, continues. If you have any further questions, please reach out to me and I'll be happy to do my best to assist you. And now I'm going to introduce Dan Graff, a Detroit Audubon's research coordinator. Ava began working at Detroit Audubon 16 as an intern through semester in Detroit through U of M. She holds her Bachelor of Science from U of M in Environmental Science, focusing on animal conservation and behavior. Ava has spent years volunteering and working on the Black Turn Monitoring Program. And thank you, Ava. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so, welcome to our presentation on Black Turn Monitoring, Monitoring by Detroit Audubon. To start off, I'm just going to share what these birds look like. These are black terns. Um, they are about the size of a robin, but their wings are much longer for their long distance migration. Um, the adults look like this guy over in the left. Um, and that is black, a black head and body with gray wings. And then the juveniles have some more white on them. Um, so to get started, I have one poll um, that Sarah will bring up for us. And that poll is, um, have you heard of black turns before? And um, how much do you know about them? So I'll give us about a minute to answer this poll. Um, my, I'm also having some technical difficulties right now with my video, so that is why my video is not on. Um, so I'm just a box that says Ava Landgraf. I'm sorry about that. I'll give us a couple more seconds. Um, so yeah, over half of people who are attending this presentation um, are just hearing about black turns for the first time. Um, and that makes a lot of sense to me. They're not super well-known birds. Um, they only live in pretty specific areas, um, although they are found all over the US. Um, so they're not super well-known and um, we are working on changing that. So I'm excited that you guys are here with us. So there is a Eurasian black tern as well as an American black tern. Um, the, the Eurasian black tern is obviously over in Europe and Asia. Um, we are studying the American black tern. So you can look at the map that I have here. Um, and this red area is where the black terns breed. Um, so you can see that they breed throughout the northern um, U.S. and in kind of southern Canada. Um, you can see that all of Michigan is encompassed um, and that their range also pretty much borders on the on the south side here, um, borders the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are a very important um, nesting spot for them because they require wetlands for nesting. 
Um, then this yellow is their migration pathways. So they migrate all over the US and Central America. Um, and then the blue is where they spend the non-breeding season. So that's basically the winter. Um, so in the winter, when it's too cold for the black terns up in this northern area, they fly down south um, and they're found uh, mostly out on the ocean waters, um, usually farther off the coast. And because of that, it makes the birds um, tricky to study. We don't know much about what they do and and where they spend um the the non-breeding season and those habits because we we don't know exactly where they are um and they're a little bit trickier to find since they're on the open water um but they do they cover a really large range um which also contributes to having a a more difficult time researching them so uh, St. Clair Flats is the largest black turn colony in Michigan. Um, and we do believe it's also one of the largest um, in the Great Lakes region. So that makes it extremely important. These large um, colonies are the, are the healthiest colonies and really um, are super important for the black turn population. Um, the, the smaller colonies can kind of come and go, but these larger colonies are more stable. Um, and so that is why the research that Detroit Audubon is doing at St. Clair Flats is so, so important for black terns all over the Great Lakes region and all over North America. Um, so I have a little heart here for Detroit. That's where we are generally. Um, and then this body of water is Lake St. Clair. And over here at the top with this little marker is St. Clair Flats. So over on this map, I zoomed up more on Lake St. Clair. And you can see this area right here where I have the red marker is St. Clair Flats. And it's actually the world's largest freshwater delta. Um, so it's a very unique habitat and it really is an amazing hotspot for, um, a lot of bird activity. So black terns diet and feeding. Uh, black terns mostly eat insects out of the air and eat little fish out of the water. Um, so they're very agile flyers and hunters. Um, they, they pick bugs out of the air kind of similar to a uh, chimney swift or a barn swallow. Um, some of their favorite insects to eat are some of these bigger guys, like the mayflies or fish flies that I have pictured here at the top. Um, and the larger dragonflies are some of their favorite foods to eat, um, especially when they're out in their breeding area in the wetland areas. Um, they also will eat little fish and it's pretty common for us to see them actually um, carrying these tiny little silvery fish um, and that's really cool they'll they'll like this picture here you can see this turn the older turn which is black um, is passing a little fish to the juvenile um, and we can see them flying with the fish because they'll bring fish over to their chicks or they will bring a fish to um, their their mated partner as kind of the the courtship behaviors um so little fish in the wetland areas as well and then when they're out over the ocean their diet is primarily little fish um so a lot of anchovies and sardines um similar to some of the fish that we eat these are some examples of what their nests look like so this is the most interesting thing about the birds. They like to nest on the water, again, in wetlands, like I mentioned, um, and they find these floating vegetation mats. Um, so this, the first nest here on the left side is a picture of a nest from St. Clair Flats. You can see that it's all of this reedy material. I believe this is probably some Phragmites and some bulrush, which I'll talk more about later. Um, and so this is just old, old plant matter that has fallen over and is now floating in the water. 
But over here, this is from a different colony in Michigan over at Wigwam Bay, kind of near Saginaw. Um, this nest is on a lily pad root muck mat. Um, so it's actually kind of old, old roots that have floated up. Um, so in different areas, they'll nest on different materials and different vegetation. Um, but either way, it's a similar style of nesting where the, the eggs are surrounded by water and floating on the water, which is very interesting. Um, sometimes it seems to be detrimental to the bird's population, and sometimes it seems to be um, helpful to keep away certain predators. Uh, so I have a video here. This is just kind of scanning the some of the flats and so that you can see kind of some of these reed mats. So I will play that. And you can also hear the sound of the last turn. And then I end the video zooming up on this little egg. Um, so you can see that sometimes their nests are really, really inconspicuous and can be really difficult to find. Sometimes it just looks like a random egg floating on the reeds. Um, and, and then you can also hear the birds chirping. The black terns are the ones that kind of sound like a dog squeaky toy to me. Um, and uh, yeah, so sometimes their nests are a little bit more built up. Sometimes they're very small, like this nest here, but they're always on different types of um, floating material in the water. Oops. There we go. Um, another thing that I love about black terns is how dedicated they are as parents. Um, many birds are very similar. Birds are. Um, really dedicated to rearing their young and put a lot of time into it and will defend their young um, with a lot of energy. Um, but that especially applies to black terns. Um, this is actually another picture that I have here that's from Wigwam Bay. Um, my, one of my coworkers from Audubon Great Lakes is on the left. That's Erin Rowan and she is banding a little chick in this picture. Um, and then over here, this is Jenny Fuller, um, another partner of ours, and the mom of the chick is standing on Jenny's head because she is so worried about the chick and is trying to do all she can to protect her chick. Um, and so she is as close as possible actually on Jenny's head. Um, because of this defensive behavior, how much they defend their chicks. Um, there's, of course, a lot of predators that they are looking out for why they have developed these um, defensive behaviors. Um, almost any animal out there that is big enough will eat um, black turn eggs and will eat um, black turn chicks, especially sometimes the chicks, once they're just a couple day, days old, they will float and swim in the water. They'll kind of paddle themselves along with their little feet. Um, and so that puts them um, in a very dangerous situation, especially with like larger turtles in the water, such as snapping turtles or larger fish in the water, such as um, pike, I think are a big one, and then also the large mouth bass. Um, and then we've also had many recordings of um, different birds and mammals, also snakes. So some of the snakes are like the water snake, um, like this guy I have pictured here. Pictured here. Um, and then over, in, over here in the picture on the right is a um, mink, and the black terns are mobbing the mink and not happy with it. Um, and then different birds. We've seen some um, herons and some crows. Um, that will come and eat black black eggs. Um, so the black terns, they are a colonial species, and so they nest and usually travel in um, large-ish groups. Um, sometimes these groups can be very small, uh, maybe like four birds, um, and sometimes these groups can be up to 50 or so birds. Um, and these birds, they work together um, when a predator does come by to, to all 
kind of bombard this predator by flying at them, um, kind of diving at them, possibly pecking them, and squeaking at them, trying to scare them away. Um, so in this picture, this is actually a picture from um, St. Clair Flats, and this is a harrier hawk, and you can see all these black terns. I think there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, eight black terns in the picture that are all mobbing this bird. And I've seen them mob almost everything possible. Um, I've seen them mob eagles and herons um, and animals that clearly had no actual interest in, in eating the black terns, like a juvenile goose. Um, and then of course, when we, uh, the researchers, come close to the bird nests, uh, we get mobbed as well. Um, so this video I have here is a picture, not a picture, is a video of um, one of my coworkers who's out in a kayak um, and they're checking on a nest, checking on the eggs in the nest. Um, and you can see these, these parents are flying overhead um, trying to mob my coworker and trying to get her to leave the eggs alone. Um, and they do this really, the really beautiful hovering. Um, to me, they really look like butterflies and I think it's so beautiful. And they, you see them kind of do that, that flutter. Um, and that flutter is a really good sign that that turn is, is hovering over something important, uh, such as a chick or a nest. Um, and so looking for that behavior is helpful when we're out looking for the nest. Ava, I have a question that just came in. Yes. Um, asking how, Tom asked, how are terns reacting to record high water levels on the Great Lakes? Mm. That is a great question um, because they are extremely impacted by these high water levels. Um, and I actually, I'll be getting to that in the presentation um, because that's a really big thing that we are looking at right now. And, and we are um, pretty concerned that it is uh, severely impacting in a negative way the black turn populations at St. Clair Flats. Um, so I will, I'll address that. Thank you for asking. Um, so there, we also have Forster turns that are out by the black ferns and the Forster turns are a little bit bigger. Um, and this is one of my volunteers that came out with me who actually got dive bombed hard enough that um, she that actually broke her skin and she had some bleeding on her scalp. Um, so sometimes our work is very dangerous. Um, Rachel was very okay, but it was very surprising to be dive bombed by a um, decent sized bird uh, spearing your head with its beak. Um, so now we all make sure that when we are near any of the turns, sometimes the Forster turns and the black turns nest near each other. Um, and, and they both do the mobbing behavior. Um, we just make sure that we wear hats in case there's any extra aggressive birds, um, since they do like to dive bomb our heads. So, why are we doing this work that clearly the black terns do not really enjoy us being around their nests? Um, so the black terns are a, um, right now considered a common bird, um, but their populations are facing really severe um, and steep declines. Um, and, and we don't actually truly understand how severe those declines are, um, how quickly they are happening, um, but we fear that they are um, happening at an unprecedented rate. And so our research, part of our research is actually to um, gain a better understanding of, of how fast these populations are decreasing um, so that we know uh, when, when we have to have some more extreme measures. Um, out, out on St. Clair Flats, you know, just by being out there for several years and looking at the population, um, me and my, my partners out there, um, we, can, we can see that these numbers are dropping and it is 
for us kind of terrifying and and we we wish that we could kind of be sounding the alarms right now and and saying we need to act we need to save this species because once the population gets so low and and then we actually decide to act on it the populations are so low that there's not as much we can do um so we're really trying to get people involved right now and trying to say that we we really need to start um using some some larger scale um efforts to protect this species um unfortunately and again this is another thing that we're looking at we don't know exactly what is driving these population declines um we have several different ideas and it probably is a mix of these things. Um, but we do not know kind of what, what is that real driving force. And so our research is, is trying to look at um, what are we finding to be the main causes and what can we do about those causes. Um, so that is, that is something that we're looking at and that is something I will um, continue to talk about in this presentation. So for our research, um, when we start the field season, which begins about middle of May until the end of July is when the black terns are nesting around St. Clair Flats, um, we begin the field season by looking at where the birds seem to be hanging around, so where we think that they'll be nesting. Um, and then we go out and we look at the bird behavior. Like I mentioned before, that kind of that, that fluttering up above and looking down, that's, that's a telltale sign that, that something is there. Um, and so when the bird does that behavior, we know that there's a chance that there's a nest around there. And so we'll go over on um, either, either walking in waders through the water, um, or now since the water levels are so high, <laughs> we have to use um, kayaks now um, to find these nests. And you can see these nests are very, hard to find. Um, so it really takes kind of a trained eye to be able to see them. Um, my mouse is circling these two little eggs here so you guys can see, but they, they just blend in incredibly. Um, and then we have this um, GIS app on our phone. Um, so GIS is Geographic Information System. Um, and we use these points to mark where the nests are. That way we can come back to the nest um, and we can record, did these chicks hatch? Did something happen to the eggs? Do we not know? So we try to record um, hatched or failed nests and use that to um, help determine numbers and, and help determine the um, increase and decrease of the populations at St. Clair Flats. Um, here's another video. It's a little bit of me talking um, just about one of our first days in the field and what we found. It is around three o'clock. We've been here since nine. We did not find any turns, well, any turn nests until right now. We finally found four nests and these parents are nice and dedicated. We're moving the boat out right now. There goes Rachel. And they're already landing back on their nest and incubating their eggs. Yay, birds! So yeah, there's there's a video and you can see, I mean, we had, we had been out in the field from nine o'clock to three o'clock and we had not found anything so far. Um, these, these northern colonies used to have a lot more birds and um, we do not know where they are. I think there, there are some of them are nesting in, in different places in St. Clair Flats um, and some of them must be completely somewhere else or or the population has truly declined by another significant amount this year. Um, it just seems every year that there's less and less birds and, and less and less um, nests that are out at the flats. Um, 
So an extra challenge. Um, so my, my first year leading the field work was last year. Um, and that was one of the first years that we had this crazy high water level. Um, and that affects the birds a lot, but it also affects our research ability. Um, so you can see that these two volunteers in the picture are wearing waders. Um, so normally we would wear our waders and the water is shallow enough that we could walk around in the water and be protected, you know, from anything and especially just from water and, and the cold of it. <laughs> um, but the water is too deep now. Um, a lot of times if you try to wear waders in certain areas, your waders will flood with water because it's too deep. Um, so now we have to carry a kayak and have one person out in that kayak. Um, and, and that's really tricky. It really limits the amount of people that we can have out looking for nests. It's we have to be a lot more careful approaching the nest. You know, they're on these delicate vegetation mats that, that if you come too close to, you're going to start sinking it. And so we have to be so cautious and um, it, it really makes the job a lot more difficult. Um, but there's just not, not much of a way around it. Um, the, the waders, when the waders fill with water, um, it's actually incredibly unsafe um, to, to have them full of water and, and actually sinking you down um, if you did get in deeper water. Um, so, so I actually, I don't use waders anymore. And if we're in a certain area where it's shallow enough and it's hot enough outside, um, I will just jump in the water um, in clothes and water shoes um, because I, I just, I feel more comfortable approaching the birds in that way. But that used to never be a problem. Um, and now last year and this year it is really, impacting the number of um, birds we are able to band and record. Um, so one of the things that we are working on is camera traps. Um, and these are really nice because these allow us to watch the turns and watch the nest without having to repeatedly disturb them. Um, and so we set up the camera facing a nest and watching the nest and the camera will take a picture about, I believe, as long as it's daylight out every 30 seconds or every minute. Um, that way we can see what is happening and, and we can see how the water level is moving and have a much better idea of if the chicks hatch and, and are able to fledge, um, if they stay clo close to the nest or if they move farther away or if the chicks do not make it or the eggs do not hatch, um, why did that happen? Was it the nest got too flooded um, or did a predator come? Uh, so the camera traps are really helpful with us learning um, what seems to be the main cause of nest failures at St. Clair Flats. Um, so I have these pictures. Um, these pictures are actually from Wigwam Bay, um, but they're really nice because you can see how these pictures turn out. Um, and you can see these pictures are able to um, locate, you know, find a couple um, nest visitors. So this is somebody who showed up on camera. Um, they did not eat the eggs. They were just hanging out nearby. Um, but if you want to think and take a guess at what you think this is, it's kind of hard. I'll give you maybe three seconds and then I'll let you know what it is. Um, but yeah, this is a visitor who came by, but you can see that the nest, the egg is still there. Um, and after this visitor left, the egg was still there. The nest was still intact. Um, so, so this bird did not, oops, I gave away its bird. This bird did not seem interested in eating the eggs and it is a great blue heron. Um, this next picture is another visitor. This one did eat the egg, unfortunately, which is a bummer. Um, this guy is a mammal. 
um, if you want to think to yourself and take a guess at what it is, um, out in Wigwam Bay, the, the mats are bigger and, and closer to the water's edge, um, which seems to make them more susceptible susceptible to this predator. Um, we've only seen this predator out at St. Clair Flats one time, um, but now this is the second time we've recorded this predator kind of eating whole sub-colonies at Wigwam. Um, so this seems to be a pretty detrimental predator. Um, and this is a raccoon, if you see the little striped tail there. Um, Apparently raccoons are pretty good swimmers, and so they will swim out to the nest and just eat all the eggs that they can find. Uh, so after we find a nest, we try to predict the hatch date of the nest. That way we're able to come back at the right time to one, um, try to capture and ban the parents, um, and then also try to see whether these eggs hatch or if something else happens to the chicks. And so we use a float test to determine how close the egg is to hatching. So you can see when the egg lies horizontal like this up here in the one to three days um, that my mouse is circling. Um, that is when the egg has just been laid. It hasn't been incubated at all yet. And then as time goes on, as the baby inside the egg develops, um, the egg starts to rise and float more vertical. Um, and then over time, tiny bits, you can see just barely that over time, the part of the egg that is breaking the water's surface is, is increasing a tiny bit every couple days. Um, so you can actually measure the amount of egg um, that is out of the water to get a more exact um, hatch date. Uh, we're also to look at the, the number of eggs to determine when hatching is. Um, the birds will lay one egg a day and then start incubating. And we know that they incubate for 21 days. Um, and then they'll incubate for those days and then the babies hatch. So using that, we can do a little bit of math. If we find one egg, we know, okay, there's going to be two more days of laying eggs and then 21 days of incubation, and then hatch happens. Um, so if we have one or two eggs, we're also able to find out the exact hatch date, which is very helpful for us. So the reason that we are finding this hatch date, one of the main reasons um, besides actually figuring out the success of the nest is to try to capture the parents. Um, and so the parents, like I mentioned before, are extremely dedicated to their nest. They will do almost anything to protect their eggs and to protect their babies. Um, and so we use the eggs and the parents' incredibly strong desire to incubate their eggs, we put a trap on top of the nest that allows us to trap the parents, of course, not harming the parents in any way. Um, but just so that we can get them in our hands for a couple minutes to record some data and let the parent go again. Um, so while we're doing this, since it is a little bit precarious, we just don't wanna take any chances. And so we actually will take the real eggs onto the boat with us. Um, and we have this special little egg holding case um, with, with soft fuzzy fabric so that we can just be as careful as possible, of course, with these delicate little eggs. So this one here in the middle, you can see has a little hole in it. The chick is just starting to hatch. And then all of these eggs that you see on the side are actually dummy eggs. So we put these fake eggs on the nest um, and then put the trap over it. And so the parents will come back to incubate their eggs. If they don't see any eggs there, they're not going to come back and try to come back to their nest. Um, so they're very smart, and we do we have to have different color eggs because sometimes the birds will notice if the egg is a completely new color, that's not my egg. I'm not going to try to incubate it and try to raise it. And so we have to have a couple color eggs that we keep on us. Um, Sometimes it doesn't matter as much, but sometimes we have parents that are very, very perceptive. Um, so we try to match the eggs. Um, and then as soon as we're done with um, 
trying to capture the adults, we put the eggs back right where they were so the parents can continue raising their young. Um, so um, this is a picture of one of our volunteers with the egg case. Um, so she is opening up the case and is probably about to put the, the real eggs in it. Um, and then she'll carry them back to the boat. And then this is one of the traps that we use that we put on the nest. We have a walk-in trap and a drop-in trap. So this walk-in has a little door. Um, and when the birds walk past, walk into the trap, they, they step on this little door and then that, that makes the door um, fall down so that they're then trapped inside this little cube. Um, and then the other nest is a drop-in and we've, I, I feel like we've found that the drop-in usually work better. Um, the drop-in, the birds are allowed to come through the top, um, but then the opening is, is too small for them to spread their wings and fly out of it. So they can come in, but then it's very difficult for them to fly out. Um, so we're able to get there pretty quickly and grab the bird and put it in a little cloth bag and we take it back to the boat and do some banding. Um, so here's some banding. Um, this is this um, little foot right here is the silver band and then on the foot over here is a color band. So we have just recently started using the color bands um, in hopes that we'll be able to identify birds from photographs um, from regular birders um, and, and determine if some of the birds that we have banded at St. Clair Flats are showing up at other places. Um, the metal bands all have the unique number. The color bands will also have a unique number on there. So this guy is yellow. 30 something. I can't see the second number in there. Um, so it will be difficult, but we're, we're hoping that at least the color can be seen. Um, so all the adults at St. Clair Flats get yellow bands and all the chicks at St. Clair Flats get pink bands. Um, there's also some birds that have been outfitted with geolocators. Um, and so though there are super tiny tracking devices um, put on the bird's ankle. They have to be under a specific weight in order to be allowed to put on the bird. So they're very, very small. Um, and those record everywhere the bird goes, but in order to get that data, we have to recapture that bird and take the geolocator off of it. Um, so that's really tricky to find those geolocators again. A couple of geolocators have been found and we were able to capture the bird and get the geolocator and get the data from there. Um, but there's still several geolocators that are out there on birds and there's a chance that we'll never get those geolocators back, which is expected. Um, and then the last thing that we are putting on the birds are, some of the birds, are these nanotags. Um, and they're, again, very small. Um, and these will record data for a, a certain amount of time, but these are nice because we don't have to capture the bird again or retrieve the nanotag to be able to get the data. Um, so we have towers set up that will, that kind of, will we'll read the nanotags if the birds come close to it so we know um, the migration path of the bird as it goes down south after the nanotag has been placed on the bird. Um, so we have a poll that Sarah can bring up. Um, we're interested. How many people have heard of bird banding before or if this is a completely new concept to you? Okay, wow, it looks like uh, over 
half of the people have heard of the term before and some people have even been able to volunteer with bird banding. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so bird banding is extremely important for um, better understanding bird populations um, and especially seeing these increases and decreases in bird populations um, that are so important for conservation. Um, all bird banders have to be extremely well trained um, to properly administer putting on these little bands, um, making sure that it does not harm the bird in any way. Um, and they're, they're extremely valuable for conservation. You can see in this picture here in the right, um, I believe these are Aaron's hands, and there's a very specific hold that you use um, that allows you to ban the bird while keeping the bird very, very still so you don't harm the leg at all. Um, so you actually hold the head in between two fingers. Their, their necks are actually super, super tiny. Um, so it looks kind of uncomfortable for the bird, but that bird is totally fine. It's definitely not <laughs> choking in any way. It's just holding the bird tightly so that it can't squirm. Um, and then another two fingers, um, I believe it is the ring finger and the thumb, hold, hold the leg of the bird so that you can hold that steady while you are placing the band on the bird's foot. Um, you squeeze the band um, so that it wraps around and there's special banding pliers that will kind of, that will close that band, of course, without harming the leg at all. So it's really important to keep that leg still um, so that you don't actually pin, accidentally pinch the leg while banding the bird. Uh, so this is one of the nano tags. Um, it's extremely light, but it does have this little antenna off the back. Um, and those are put on with kind of little mini backpacks um, is what they're called. It, 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 it's actually a, a certain type of string that um, wraps around the bird's legs. And that string is designed to uh, disintegrate after several months. So once the nanotag um, is not recording any more information, um, it's designed to fall off. That way it doesn't um, continue staying on the bird just in case it does cause any problems. Um, and then this is an example of one of the MODIS towers. So this is the tower that is set up to record if any bird with a nanotag comes close to it, it will pick up that signal. Um, and these are really cool because the MODIS tower will actually pick up any nano tag on any bird. Um, so I believe National Audubon and many other um, bird research organizations are working on having more MODIS towers set up um, throughout the U.S. and in other countries um, so that we're able to get more data on migrating birds. Uh, after we put a band on the adult bird, there's a couple measurements we take. Um, we look at the amount of fat on the bird and the feathers and the length of the wings. Um, a couple different things. We found that usually um, the male birds, the male black terns are a little bit bigger. Um, here is another video of one of the birds. Um, this is Erin releasing a bird that she banded. Um, we definite our goal when banding is to um, work very, very carefully to not harm the bird at all. Um, and then as, as soon as we're ready to let the bird go um, so that it can get back to nesting. Uh, then we also do a similar thing with chicks. Um, we do not take all of the same measurements um, because they barely have wings that you could measure, um, but we do take a weight on the chicks and that helps us to determine the age of the chick. Um, and then we do put bands on the chick and so the chick will get a little silver band and since the chick is at St. Clair Flats, it will get a little pink band on its ankle as well. 
Um, so this is a chick that's a little bit older on a scale. Um, and you can see a couple pin feathers are coming in. And this is a, a um, younger chick here. And you can also see this, these are the banding pliers. And so they have this little kind of hole here and that is where the band goes to close up the band. Um, and this is another video of Erin with an older chick and she is banding it. And you can see um, how she's holding the bird in her hands to keep it super, super still while she's banding. And you can see that the, the baby is, he's old enough to be calling back to the parents. Um, and the parents are very upset as well. Ava, I, I just, um, Diane added a, a video that she took, a 13 minute video of Aaron banding. Oh, cool. I added that, I added that box if anyone is interested in checking that out. Perfect, thank you. Um, so here we have another picture. Here's a uh, fledgling with the nano tag, and here is one of the pink bands. And you can see the little number 33 on this chick. Um, one of our focuses right now is putting the nano tags on the fledgling birds um, because juvenile birds or first year birds. Um, they, they generally migrate in a different way than the adults do. Um, they'll migrate down to the wintering grounds um, and then they will stay there for a year or so um, until they return back up um, to the northern areas for nesting. So they take a couple years off to kind of grow um, and you kind of develop some of their hunting skills and build up muscles um, before they go back into um, trying to breed. Um, so here are some of our concerns and some of the things that we believe are um, affecting the black turn populations. Um, we think that because there could be increased predation, um, all of these are just possibilities. We have no research that really proves any of these um, has more of an impact than the others. So all of these are just things that we have discussed. Um, this is a large snapping turtle that we saw out at St. Clair Flats. Um, and this is a water snake that we saw out at St. Clair Flats. And this is actually a picture from um, a, a video, I think it's Blue Planet, where there are these grouper fish that have adapted to actually eating the, I think they're sooty terns, but it's another type of tern. Um, and they've adapted to eating these terns if they um, are in the water or even if they're like flying above the water, they know how to jump out and grab the terns. Um, so I definitely believe that a lot of the chicks that are being eaten are being eaten by large fish out at St. Clair Flats. Um, another problem is lack of food. We know that insect populations are dropping drastically. Um, we can see that some of the bugs I mentioned, you know, the mayflies and dragonflies are um, facing pretty detrimental um, population declines. Similarly, we're seeing um, fish facing very large population declines, and especially little, the little fish um, that black terns need to feed to their babies. Um, if, if they can only find larger fish, those fish are too large for the babies to eat. Um, we believe that trash and plastic in the water could be impacting turns. Um, it, is, it is possible that these population declines are due to adult survival rate being low. Maybe, maybe there are a lot of chicks that fledge um, and are able to migrate back south, but that the adults are just not living long enough lives because they're ingesting too much um, plastic and especially little tiny pieces of plastic that they get through fish. Um, another thing that we see commonly at St. Clair Flats is a lot of boaters. 
um, and that is wonderful. It is a really, really nice place for boating. Um, a lot of um, just kind of joy ride boating and a lot of fishermen. Um, this is a picture of some of the boaters out um, for Javi Nooner, a big lake boating holiday. Um, but it is, it does become a little bit more of an issue when people are boating by um, some of the nesting areas at very fast speeds. So a lot of these little like jet ski wave runner things um, can boat by where the black terns are nesting very, very easily. And they create pretty large waves um, that can knock an egg out of the nest very easily. Um, and, and I just, I believe that so many of these boaters have no idea. Um, so I, I think that's a pretty significant issue for the black terns nesting at St. Clair Flats. Um, invasive vegetation over here, this um, picture on the right is bulrush, which is their preferred vegetation. But we also have Phragmites and a hybrid species of cattail that is out competing the bulrush. Um, and it seems that the black terns are starting to nest in, in these invasive vegetation types more, um, but it's definitely not ideal for their nesting. Um, these um, invasive vegetation types limit the amount of other vegetation. So this is an example of a nest that just over time the mat was not big enough and it slowly fell apart and has just sunken into the water. Um, I don't know if these eggs or chicks hatched or were able to make it, but you can see that this the nest now is just barely intact. I mean really it couldn't it couldn't hold anything on there. Um, and then the picture on the right is, is an area where we used to have large vegetation mats and, and now there's just nothing. Um, like we mentioned before, there's been extremely high water levels. Um, so this line up at the top is the water level in 2019 and over here at the bottom is 2013. So every year it's increasing and 2020 is even higher than 2019. Um, and this is, is flooding out some of the nests um, and is really changing the habitat where the black ferns used to nest. Um, with the higher water levels, um, the waves are larger and there's also been an increase in storms and these storms can be really detrimental to the turn populations as well. Again, knocking eggs out of the nest and into the water or, or possibly getting um, newborn chicks too, too wet and they're not able to survive. Um, so this is an example of how crazy the water level is at St. Clair Flats. Um, the water level is like right up at people's doorsteps now. Um, and then over here is a nest and you can see that this whole mat is wet and, and the, the nest here is the only dry part on here. And so if, if that nest keeps getting, if the water keeps getting onto the nest and it gets too wet, it could become too cold and fall apart and not be suitable for the babies to survive. Um, but we actually, for this nest here, that was a nest we just recently visited, um, we put a little platform under it. Um, and so we are putting in these little floating platforms. Um, some of them are being put um, out for the black terns to choose to nest on and then some we are actually just putting underwater and then letting them float up and push the nest up out of the water um and those i i believe we haven't tried these before at st Clair flats but they work in areas of wisconsin um and for some of the eurasian terns and so i think these will really help the nest um stay together especially during storms and and if they are close to um wakes from boats going by um there's a couple laws um that are right now or or will be soon going through the house and the senate um, these are very important. There's a lot of acts right now um, that are concerning um, fish 
and the little fish that seabirds depend on. Um, and so if you would be interested in supporting these acts, um, Sarah is going to put a link in the text box. Um, and that is a link to sign up for the Audubon Action Alerts. And those are super, super easy. They will just send you an update about any um, act going through that applies to bird conservation. And, and it will let you sign your name to share with your um, Congress people that you support this act and that you want your Congress members to support that act. Um, we could not function without all of our partners. Um, the Department of Natural Resources out at St. Clair Flats is an amazing partner. We could not at all function without them. Um, they provide so much support for us, especially letting us borrow their boats. Um, that is really important. Um, so please uh, remember to support your local DNR. Um, and then we have one more poll for you guys. Um, to allow us to get a little bit more information about um, if you're interested in um, helping out with black turn um, conservation in uh, Southeast Michigan. Um, while you guys are voting, I will just share a little bit more. Um, again, if you're interested in supporting with emails to political officials, um, please sign up for the Audubon Action Alerts um, that Sarah put that link. Um, I always respond to them and they're very nice. They're very descriptive and most of them are um, bipartisan laws that really anybody who supports the environment can get behind and agree with. Um, we are looking to have some volunteer opportunities um, for having some nest platform building events. Um, we were planning on doing that this year, but coronavirus does not allow us to continue with those plans. Um, the color bands, are now out on several birds. There's not a ton that have the color bands, um, but if you are out at St. Clair Flats and you are a fisherman or a birder um, who, who commonly has a camera on them, if you're able to try to take some extra pictures of black terns, um, especially when they're out sitting on posts, they really like to sit at the docks, um, if you're able to take some pictures and then we might be able to see a pink or a yellow band, if you get a picture like that and email it to us, that would be amazing. We're trying to get more turns to have these color bands and then build up the color band reciting program. Um, and then donations are of course extremely appreciated. Um, Sarah is going to put a link in the text box um, for donating to Detroit Audubon if you would like to support this black turn monitoring work. Um, it's, it's very difficult for funding this research because there's not a lot of funding for um, monitoring efforts. Um, there's mostly funding for these um, large scale restoration efforts, but those efforts um, are not applicable to what black turns need right now. And so we are really focusing on trying to support our basic funding. That way we can develop um, actions for large scale conservation. Um, so if you have the ability to donate, that would be wonderful. Um, of course, this is a very, very hard time right now and we do not expect you to donate if you are not able. Um, so 
thank you everybody so much um, for attending. I really appreciate it. I love this work. Um, I'm so thankful I get to do it and I'm very happy to share with all of you. Ava, we did have a couple questions and I think we're, we're happy to stay on a few more minutes if other people would like to, um, if that would be okay, Ava, can I read those to you? Yes. Uh, is why isn't it ideal for nesting in invasive plants? Oh, great question. I wanted to go into this, but we were running short on time, and so I skipped it, but now I get to go into it. Um, so the bulrush usually spreads or it grows in a more patchy pattern that is more ideal for the black turn nesting. Um, they really like if there's vegetation and then a little kind of open patch where they can nest and then more vegetation and that way they can nest in an area that's nice and hidden and nice and protected. Um, the Phragmites and the hybrid cattail, they grow in just extremely dense um, spreads, I guess. And since they're so densely packed together, it really doesn't allow any space for nesting inside um, kind of that, that reedy area. The terns have to nest on the outside of it, and that just leaves the nest a little bit more susceptible to waves and storms, predators, all of that. Okay. Thank you. Um, someone else, Michelle asked if we could, if it'd be possible for us to put together a script uh, about the Forage Fish Conservation Act so that um, folks can make calls. That would be wonderful. Yes, I have something um, that we will be sending out. Um, it's for another act um, that is in the work that specifically is designed to support seabirds. Um, it is a I believe Audubon Great Lakes and National Audubon Initiative. Um, and so we will send that out with information. Um, so we'll include in an email some more ways that you can get involved um, and some more information on current apps so that if you are available to make some phone calls, you are able to do that. We would appreciate that so much. Absolutely. All right, and our last question was from Joanna. Is there any effort to prohibit jet skis in the marshes? Yeah, that's, that's so tricky. You know, there's, it's, it's just hard for people to realize where the birds are. And, and St. Clair Flats is such a wonderful place for boating recreation. We definitely don't, we don't want to make this a issue that is birds versus boaters. We, we want to all work together. Um, and so we're not, we're, we're looking for a way that we can work with boaters um, and, and work more through education um, rather than coming up with, with any types of, um, restrictions or, or, or signs that could frustrate people if they don't really understand um, the point, the point of um, possibly slowing down in certain areas. Um, so we're, we're not considering really restrictions at the moment. We're hoping to um, spread more awareness through education. Um, and, and work with the people who, who live around St. Clair Flats and are regularly out there boating. Cause it's, in many ways, it is their special bird. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Ava. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us today, this afternoon. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. I know I always learn something new about the black terns and they're very, they're very cool little birds. Um, and just to let you know, our next webinar will be next Wednesday at noon. Um, we've invited Tiffany Carey. She's Great Lakes Habitat and Education Coordinator from National Wildlife Federation. And she's providing an overview presentation of the NW Good Grounds Program, which supports about Detroit houses of worship and faith-based uh, native plant uh, garden. So that should be great. And if you are not currently receiving our 
uh, Flyway Express in your email and would like to, please reach out to us and let us know. Uh, otherwise, you can find all of that information on our website or on Facebook as well. So everyone have a wonderful uh, Thank you for joining us. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much.